This evening, uh, we're going to be continuing our summer series in which we're learning how to pray by praying along with the Apostle Paul. And actually, our whole summer program is centered around learning how to pray because you could say that as Christians, we are defined by who it is that we pray to. Um, And, well, just like I am defined as a son because I have a mother, and you might say that my sonship is... I guess, fulfilled by the relationship that I have with her, well, in a similar way, I'm defined as a Christian because of who I pray to, but my Christianity, you might say, is fulfilled as I continue to grow in prayerful dependence on the God that I pray to. And actually, it goes even more than that, I think. It's our conviction at All Souls that to pray, well, it's actually to reach your full human potential. When you see someone praying, kneeling with their hands folded and their eyes closed, it would be easy to think that not much is actually happening there at that moment. But at All Souls, we believe that each one of us has been created with the capacity to lift up our hearts to the Lord, which means you could say that you and I are never more fully human than when we are on our knees with our eyes closed, our hands folded, and our hearts lifted up to our Heavenly Father in prayer. So over the course of the summer, we're opening up God's Word to learn how to pray. Last week, we looked at Paul's prayer for the Thessalonians in chapter 1 of his second letter to them. And we saw that in the midst of fierce trials and tribulations, Paul's big prayer for the Thessalonians in that second letter wasn't for a change of circumstances, but for their spiritual growth. And this week, we're uh, going to be opening up some of the logic of that spiritual growth that Paul was praying for by looking at the prayer that Paul prayed for them in his previous letter to the Thessalonians. Last week was two Thessalonians. This week, it's his previous letter, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. As we look at the prayer Paul prayed in his first letter, what we're going to see is how love and faith shaped the way that Paul prayed for the Thessalonians and for their spiritual growth. Because it's those two words, love and faith, that Paul's entire prayer for the Thessalonians is built around. And it's how those two words relate to one another. You might say the logic of love and faith that shapes his prayer for them. At which point, it's probably worth acknowledging that those two words, love and faith, well, they've really become very strongly associated uh, with the Church of England's debates about human sexuality. So I want to say up front, that's not what I'm going to be talking about. That debate is not what I'm going to be opening up this evening, because this passage is not about marriage or sex or romance. Uh, But that being said, as we probe that logic, the logic of love and faith, Well, what we see will inevitably have implications for all sorts of wider issues, including for the conversations happening in the Church of England. Um, I won't be drawing them out here, but that would be perhaps a fascinating conversation to have around the corner at the stag's head over some food after this. So, as we probe the logic of love and faith in Paul's prayer for the Thessalonians, I've got three points for us that string together into a sentence. Paul is brought to life by the Thessalonians' faith, point one, which point two overflows in love. So point three, he prays for their faith to grow. Firstly, Paul is brought to life by the Thessalonians' faith. Pretty much this whole sermon is going to be unpacking verses seven and eight. So look down at those verses with me and let me read them for us. Starting at verse 7. Therefore, brothers and sisters, in all our distress and persecution, we were encouraged about you because of your faith. For now, we really live since you are standing firm in the Lord. Pretty much this whole sermon is going to be unpacking 7 and 8. And at the heart of those verses is that word, faith. So let's take a couple of moments to remind ourselves what it is that that word means. Faith, 
as it's described in Scripture, is the gift of God through which we receive all of his other blessings. It's the gateway blessing to which we owe all the other blessings of the Christian life. Scripture tells us that it's by faith we are justified and regenerated, that we are adopted and renewed, that we are sanctified and glorified and resurrected and all of the other glorious promises that God makes to us in the gospel. Faith is the the gateway blessing through which we receive all the other blessings of our entire Christian life because it is by faith that we grasp hold of and cling on to the promises of God, which means it is through faith that we receive everything that God has promised to us in the gospel. That's what faith is. That's what faith does. Faith is the habit of the soul that accepts and receives that what God has said or promised to us is true, even and especially when what God says or promises to us seems just totally unreasonable from what we can see or imagine. And in fact, that is the entire hope of the Christian, isn't it? The entire hope of the Christian is in things that surpass the very best things that we can see and the biggest thoughts that we can imagine. In the gospel, God promises things that no eye has seen, that no ear has heard, and that no human mind has ever conceived. Things that go beyond what we can sense and go beyond what we can reason. Things that can only be accepted by faith. In the gospel, God promises resurrection, but to the dead. And so it's by faith that we accept God's word as true and receive what he promised. In the gospel, God promises eternal life, but to people like you and me who are decaying. And so it is only by faith that we will accept his word as true and receive eternal life. In the gospel, God promises righteousness, but to people like you and I, to sinners. And so it is by faith alone that we accept his promise and receive his righteousness as our own. Faith is a remarkable and a wonderful gift, the gateway blessing through which we receive all of God's other blessings, the gift by which we grasp hold of and cling on to the promises of God. And the more greatly that those promises surpass the very best of what we can see or imagine. And the more steadfastly that we cling on to those promises despite what we can see or imagine, well, the more brightly and brilliantly and beautifully our faith will shine. Which is why there is no faith that shines more brightly or brilliantly or beautifully than faith in the midst of persecution. There is no faith that shines more brilliantly than faith that clings to God's promise of resurrection while the whole world is trying to put it to death. There is no faith that shines more brightly than faith that clings to God's promise of everlasting life while the world is trying to tear it apart. And there is no faith that shines more beautifully than faith that clings to God's promise of forgiveness while the whole world is trying to drive it into the pit of despair. And it is that faith, faith that, in the words of 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 13, faith that received the word of God not as a human word, but as it actually is the word of God. Faith that, 2 verse 15, suffered the same persecutions as Jesus suffered. It is that faith, that beautiful, brilliant, and bright faith that Paul has seen in the Thessalonians and that Timothy has brought good news about in 3 verse 6. Let me read that verse. 3 verse 6, page 1187. But Timothy has just now come to us from you and has brought good news about your faith. Because what Paul is saying in 3 verse 8 is that the Thessalonians' faith is so steadfast, so brilliant and bright, 
that it doesn't just bring the Thessalonians to life in the gospel as they cling to God's promises in the midst of persecution. Their faith is so brilliant and bright that it actually brings Paul and Timothy to life too. Let me read verses seven and eight again. Look down, verse seven. Therefore, brothers and sisters, in all our distress and persecution, we were encouraged about you because of your faith. For now, we really live since you are standing firm in the Lord. Now we really live since you are standing firm. It's as though Paul and Timothy and the Thessalonians are knitted so tightly together that the faith of the Thessalonians isn't just bringing life to them, it's actually giving life to Paul and to Timothy as well. It's as though the bond of love between Paul and Timothy and the Thessalonians is so tight. Their mutual love has knitted their hearts together so closely that the faith of one of them has actually become a gateway of God's blessing to all the others. And to see more of the logic of that, we need to look at the couple of verses before verse 8 and the couple of verses after it as well, because it's in those couple of verses before and after verse eight that we see how it is that Paul is brought to life by the Thessalonians' faith. Point one, Paul is brought to life by the Thessalonians' faith. Point two, which overflows in love. Let's consider those verses that lead up to verse eight. In verse five, Paul sent Timothy to inquire about the Thessalonians' faith. But did you notice that in verses six and seven, well, I actually didn't read a little bit of it. Because in verses six and seven, it wasn't just their faith that he reported back about. Let me read it, verse six. But now that Timothy has come to us from you and has brought us the good news of your faith and love, and reported that you always remember us kindly and long to see us as we long to see you. For this reason, brothers, in all our distress and affliction, we have been comforted about you through your faith. In verse 5, Paul sent Timothy to inquire about the Thessalonians' faith. But in verse 6, it's good news about their love as well as their faith that Timothy is reporting back, a report of their kind memory of Paul and his friends, as well as of their deep longing to see them. Timothy brings good news about the Thessalonians' love as well as their faith. And in verse seven, it's that that Paul is comforted about in his distress. He has understood that the Thessalonians' love for Paul and his friends reported by Timothy is evidence of the steadfastness of their faith. To Paul and to Timothy, the evidence of the Thessalonians' steadfast faith is their overflowing love and longing and kind memory of Paul and Timothy. Because the mark of living faith is how it overflows in love. Living faith in God's promises. Living faith that grasps hold of and clings to what God has promised. Living faith like that, well, it is always marked out by love for God's people. Because when you cling to God's promises, you will always, slowly but surely, begin to be filled with heartfelt love for the God who has made those promises And as you begin to be filled with love for the God who has made all those promises, well, you will inevitably begin to be filled with love for everything that he loves and everyone that he loves for his sake. As you cling by faith to God's promises, your heart will inevitably fill up with love for God and for his people too. And the more steadfast your faith is in God's promises, well, the more your love for God's people will begin to overflow too. Simply put, that is the logic of love and faith according to scripture. When you put your faith in God, you will begin to love what he loves for his sake. Steadfast faith 
overflows in love for what God loves, and overflowing love for what God loves is grown out of steadfast faith in God's promises. So to Paul and to Timothy, the evidence of the Thessalonians' faith is their love for God's people, and that faith, evidenced by that love, is such a comfort to Paul that verse 8, he says it is actually bringing him to life. Because when he hears about the Thessalonians' love for God's people, of their kind memory for him and his friends, and their deep longing to see them, well, that just lifts his heart into the very presence of God himself. See, verses 5 and 7 show us that the love of the Thessalonians was evidence to Paul of their faith. But I think the comfort that Paul is feeling here goes deeper than factual reassurance. The overflowing love and deep longing of the Thessalonians, well, it isn't just an abstract piece of data for Paul. Their love isn't just a useful fact or an interesting metric. The love of the Thessalonians for Paul has turned their steadfast faith from a fact that Paul knows into a blessing that he actually experiences. He isn't just hearing information about their steadfast faith. Now, he is actually experiencing the steadfastness of their faith in their overflowing love towards him. And we see what that means for him in the next few verses. Verses 8 and 9, look at them with me. Verse 8. For now we really live since you are standing firm in the Lord. How can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy we have in the presence of God because of you? Paul hasn't just heard information about their steadfast faith. He has experienced the steadfastness of their faith in the overflowing love that they have towards him and it is bringing his soul to life. Because as Paul hears the good news about how the Thessalonians are clinging to God in steadfast faith, and as he feels the overflowing love that they have towards him, well, he is actually experiencing the very presence of God himself through the faith and love of his people. He can see that the Thessalonians are clinging steadfastly to God's promises in the face of severe suffering, and he can feel the hearts of the Thessalonians longing out for him and spiritually reaching out to him in love. And as they cling to God's promises, and as they long for and reach out to him, overflowing in love, well, their faith and their love is spiritually drawing Paul into the very presence of God himself, to delight in God through them, and to actually experience in them the reality of what God has promised. As Christians, our faith is in God's promises, which surpass the very best of what we can see or we can imagine. But as the faith of the Thessalonians in God overflows in love for Paul, well, they have actually become a foretaste of the reality of what God has promised, bringing God's love down from heaven for Paul to actually experience. For Paul, the truth of God's promises is being fulfilled in the love of God's people. So that if I can put it a bit like this, when the Thessalonians cling to God and smile towards Paul, all of God's promises are coming true to him through them. At which point, having thanked the Lord for the Thessalonians, he now turns to pray for them. Point one, Paul is brought to life by the Thessalonians' faith, which, point two, overflows in love. So point three, he prays for their faith to grow. This sermon is part of a series on prayer, and so far we've um, only looked at the underlying logic of love and faith that has been shaping Paul's prayer. So as we draw to a close, let's look at the prayer itself. Verses 10 to 13, let me read them. Verse 10, night and day, we pray most earnestly that we may see you again 
and supply what is lacking in your faith. Now, may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus clear the way for us to come to you. May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else, just as ours does for you. May he strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all his holy ones. The Thessalonians' steadfast faith is overflowing in love. So what does Paul pray for them? Well, he prays that their faith would grow so that their love would increase even more. Because the only way to overflow more and more in love for what God loves is to cling more and more closely to what God says. The only love that Paul prays for and the only love that Paul recognizes here and across the whole New Testament is love that overflows from a faith that is clinging to what God has said or promised to be true. There is no other kind of Christian faith, not that Paul recognizes, than faith that loves what God loves. And that is the only kind of love that could possibly answer Paul's prayers in 1 Thessalonians 3. Paul prays for the Thessalonians that their faith would grow so that their love would increase. And as Paul prays that their faith would grow so that their love would increase, he prays that God would use him in order to do that. That God would clear the way to use him to provide what is lacking in their faith so that the love he has for them and has experienced from them would overflow and increase and abound all the more. Two prayers, a prayer for the Thessalonians and a prayer that Paul might be the answer to that first prayer, which gives us two applications as we close. First, an application for how we pray for others. Friends, if you long for God's people to love the world like Jesus loved it, well then pray that God's people would be as unflinching in faith as Jesus was. If you long for God's promises to be realized in London, then pray that churches in London would cling to God's promises. If your prayer is that this city might be filled with love, then pray for this city to be filled with faith. Let's let our prayers be shaped by the logic of love and faith as Paul lays out it, lays it out across his letters. And second application, an application for how we might live as an answer to our own prayers. All souls, if you want to abound in love, we'll be steadfast in faith. If you want to be a blessing to the people of this church and the Church of England and the church around the world, we'll be steadfast in faith. And if you want to live as the visible presence of God himself, filling this world with his divine joy, mediating his presence to those that you meet, we'll pray that God would supply what is lacking in your faith because being steadfast in faith is not the same thing as stagnating in it. All souls, if you love God's people, and if you want to love God's people, then pray that you would make God's promises visible by standing firm on them. Because it is hard to trust God in a world that hates him. But that is exactly what Paul and the Thessalonians needed from each other. And that is exactly what our brothers and sisters around the world, in this city and around this country, need from us. What our brothers and sisters need from us is for God's promises to be made real in the way that we love one another. And the only way we can do that is by clinging to those promises for ourselves. So, this summer, let's pray that our faith would be steadfast. Let's pray that our love would overflow. And let's let's pray that as our faith in God overflows in love for God's people, that we would become the visible presence of God, of the surpassing greatness 
of what God has promised so that when our brothers and sisters hear about us, they might feel through us the everlasting smile of our Father in heaven. Let me use some of the words of this prayer to pray for us as the band comes up. Borrowing words from Paul's prayer for the Thessalonians, we pray, Lord God, how can we thank you enough in return for all the joy we have in your presence because of the steadfast faith of our brothers and sisters around the world and in this room? Would you keep us steadfast together, we pray, and would you use your people to provide whatever is lacking in our faith? And Lord God, as you grow us in faith, would you make our love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else so that we would be blameless and holy in your presence and so that your promises would be made real in our love for your people. And we pray that with great confidence if we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.